Creative Freedom Summit, day three. And it's my honor to introduce Jason to us this time to show us some stuff in Blender. So if you have questions for him, don't feel free to leave them in the chat or the etherpad and someone will uh, jump on the screen and chat, uh, give those to Jason to answer. So take it away. Perfect. Hi. Uh, I guess let me let me for, for those of you who don't know who I am. Also, I talk with my hands a lot. Uh, I'm Jason Van Gumster. Um, I guess the easiest thing to do is to screen share just a little second here. Let's see if I can click those buttons fast enough. Share. All right. So I'm just making sure I most of my time these days is spent working with Orange Turbine. Orange Turbine is a consulting company specifically set up for uh, helping studios and tool makers integrate Blender into larger production pipelines. Uh, but that is not necessarily lim limited to media and entertainment, but we're also doing stuff for uh, manufacturing. And I mean, Blender gets used in all sorts of different wild and crazy places. And so finding ways to get that to work and getting those things trained, uh, getting people trained up on how to use them is, is kind of kind of what, what this is all about and what we do. Orange Turbine is part of CG Cookie, which is mostly related to uh, tutorials and education of Blender. So th this is more hands-on consultation sort of things. So that is me currently. Let's stop sharing so I can have my goofy face here. Stop sharing. Um, and so, yeah, that's me currently. Uh, I also, I wrote Blender for Dummies. And also for the last 10 years, I have been doing... Um, work in currency design, which is the weirdest application of animation that I have ever been involved with. Uh, and so when, when it comes to thinking about what to talk about for this particular talk, uh, design sort of came in mind. But one of the things I, I really want to think about is how design, like depending on your community, design can be anything. And we tend to get a little bit myopic about what design is, right? You talk to a user interface person and user interface design, and that's going to be usually application-based or web-based or something along those lines. You talk to uh, an industrial designer and you're talking about products and things and, and things that move around. Uh, you start talking to currency designers, which by the way, is technically also a user interface. Uh, and you're talking about you know designing for usability, but also making sure that things are secure. And so you have these accessibility, usability, all these things are interacting. And there's a lot of different things that are involved here with what sort of comprises design. And the really cool thing is that you can use Blender for nearly every facet of it, which is one of the really cool things about it because um, Blender, as you guys have seen in some of the other talks already, is is a uh, Swiss Army chainsaw of, of computer graphics. And you can do 3D, you can do compositing, you can do drawing with Reese Pencil, you can do video editing, uh, you can do audio editing if you really, really want to. Uh, you might want to try something a little bit different, but you can. Uh, there, there's, and you can do a lot of procedures. Like you can do Python coding. There's a lot of different things you can do. And all of those things relate or comprise or are adjacent to design. And so Blender becomes a really solid tool for that sort of thing. So when I was trying to think of something to really show about that, I actually, I'm going to lean away from stuff that shows up on screen and, and stuff that shows up uh, design wise and, and that respect. I'm thinking about designs that, that you do more manually, more with your hands. And what I mean by that is that um, making things, right? And so Blender can facilitate that as well. Blender and open source in general can facil facilitate that. And so one of the other fun things that I do, and I will be bouncing back and forth between my, my face and screen sharing. So hopefully it, is more or less seamless. One of the other things that I tend to do is I make rings out of wood. Uh, this is a, a yeah, I'm showing my hand here when it's only in the side now instead of the actual screen. But these these are rings that I've made uh, when I basically bend the wood and sometimes I carve on them, sometimes I do co complex inlays and these sort of things. And it's, it's sort of a thing I do on the <clears throat> it's something I do on the side for a hobby. And the challenge that I had was I do like carving. I do like working on these things and, and uh, making more intricate and complex designs. The challenge is that uh, you're working very, very small. And so if you're trying to carve on something, small knives are helpful, but you're trying to hold the, the, the you know, if I'm working on it, I'm holding the ring and I'm trying to dig into it and carve on it. And um, it can be very, very difficult. And from my experience in, um, in, uh, 
art and currency design. Engravers have a really cool tool. It's it's a, basically a stand, and you have a bunch of little pegs on it, and it rotates in multiple axes, and you put your whatever you're engraving in that, and you can lock it into place, and then you can actually do the engraving and stuff like that. Now, those tools, that, that stand car, uh, engraving stand thing, really cool, really awesome, usually machined out of, like, high-quality metal and really, really awesome stuff, and then, you know, entry price for that's, like, close to a thousand dollars us and i don't really have that <laughs> especially for you know what, what amounts to a hobby of, of making rings and carving on them so i took it upon myself to try to design something like that for myself considering things of of being usable uh usable for that particular task and that means i'm designing an actual tool I'm designing a thing for for making things, right? I'm, I'm designing a tool, which is um, you have to think about all these different aspects, uh, not just spatially, but then you think about how it's moving, how it's changing, how I'm going to interact with it, and these sort of things. And I'm not going to show the physical thing yet. I will start showing blendery things with that. And so we'll start with this. So back to sharing screens and launching yonder blender by the way uh for during the break there is the uh tin cube challenge and this is that tin cube challenge making a teacup thank you david for uh saying that it was something to to try and do so it did it, it did it's there yay but that's not what we're talking about we're talking about this thing this is my carving mount and what it is, is it's built around a single five pound weight. So a five pound uh, disc, rate, disc uh, weight lives in there. And the idea is I needed something that I can put the ring on variable in size and still work with. And so the, the cool thing is that because you have tools like Blender that allow you to model and animate, once you create it, you can actually disassemble the whole thing and then make cool animations about it. So this is this thing taken apart and coming back together. But so there are some parts that will have to be manufactured. And then there are some parts that, that I can actually just get. And then there are some design considerations within that. So this here <laughs> is my stand-in for a five pound weight. And I mean, modeling this in Blender is pretty straightforward. I mean, it's uh, simple geometry for for those sort of tasks. And one of the cool things about working in in for these sort of things that are going to be sort of hard body and actually made physically, they're not deforming, they're not changing in this case. So I don't have to worry so much about really, really ugly topology, like whatever craziness is going on here. But I do need to have something that says, okay, I can look at that and that's a five pound weight. Now, then I need something for it to live in. And so that's going to be here. And then, so the other thing is that I, I decided I was going to be 3D printing this because, you know, um, the PLA film is is relatively inexpensive. So you also have to think about how it's being made, right? What if I if I print this and maybe it's nicer to have this beveled in, a, in the other direction so my weight doesn't come out, then I have to worry about supports and struts and trying to clean that up from the print. So always thinking about, you know, you're when you're doing design, especially when you're doing 3D des spatial design and you're knowing about the manufacturing process, then you have to think about, okay, what's going to facilitate making that more effective? So you're not just thinking about design as it pertains to, again, design, design fits in everywhere, which again, I've said before, gives us a little bit of hubris, but it's also one of those things where you have to think about that for every stage, right? You're, you're not just designing the tool. You're also designing the process by which you're making it. And then once it's made, as someone who's using it, you're probably going to subvert that design anyway to, uh, to to make it suit whatever your particular needs are. Now, more and more customizing can be done, but we'll get into that in a second. So, yeah, this is, again, a fairly simple shape, um, just extrusions. And there are some fun things you can do with Blender here with um, that edge loop there. Give you some harder edges. Uh, so this is a crease actually doesn't show up nicely in this render size, but uh, so from here we can uh, switch over. Now, 
the one thing that I really wanted this to be able to do is rotate on the whole thing. I wanted to be able to rotate around the, the, the center axis here so that you can, you can actually move it. So I'm oh, actually, I have, yeah, I, I should be able to do that because I'm usually going to be holding the knife that I'm carving with in my right hand, but I need different angles to, to play with it. So this means that atop my weight, the thing here that is, I can actually show the whole assembly here. This obviously would be printed the other way around. That gives us an axis and gives us the, and this actually, I believe, goes inside that. Whee! Now, this is another fun thing to think about when you're doing 3D printing in particular. I did a lot of time, spent a lot of time measuring around this weight and spending time with the rulers and calipers trying to trying to make sure you have things right. And one of the really nice tools in Blender for that is this measure tool. Um, so you can actually measure distances pretty well and you can snap it as well to different components to really get a better sense of, ooh, that is not even across the, side, the center there. That's better. So yeah, but the thing is when you do 3D printing, your tolerances are always, uh, unless you're dealing with really, really nice 3D printers, your tolerances are always not nearly as, uh, as, as precise as you would like them to be. So there is some iterative movement here in trying to, like this, this is probably still a bit tight, but after, after moving around enough that this actually wore itself down, but I did have to print this a few times for it to even fit properly because my 3D printer has uh, tolerances that need to be addressed and are not necessarily well documented. You can try and math it out a little bit, but um, they're basically, there's, it's a lot of trial and error to try and get that right. From here, this little fun thing is a little Lazy Susan. Now there's a fun thing about this. Uh, again, I just needed it to be the right dimensions and space. I needed to be able to have the holes for drilling it into things. And there is <clears throat> a, uh, a savvy person would notice that, uh, that there's this, quickly you'll notice that there's a problem with, with what, what I'm about to show you here. And that is, so this is the most complex part. I'll show both of these. This is the most complex part of the whole thing. And this little Lazy Susan uh, bearing lives right there and nestles itself right there. And the idea was that I would screw this into there and screw this into here. The problem, and this was one of those things that I uh, realized way too late, is that in order to screw this into there and this into there, uh, you can only really do one of those because the whole thing closes up. So if I screw this one into the base, I have no means of screwing it into the top. Likewise, if I screw it into the top, then I have no means of screwing it into the base because uh, yeah, that would, that would uh, thinking spatially, thinking about manufacturing. Fortunately, I was somewhat clever in that I designed this shape in the bottom. So on the physical one that, that, that I finished, uh, this is actually screwed in to the bottom component and this just rests on there. And because tolerances are pretty tight, uh, it doesn't move around and everything is happy and golden. Though I wouldn't recommend necessarily picking up the whole device by the outside casing because some might slip off because it's a five pound weight in there. And uh, so this is, this is a design improvement that would, uh, that I would like to like to address at some point, probably the easiest way to do it is just put some kind of adhesive here and then don't worry about screwing it into it. Just use adhesive, use uh, super glue or an epoxy or something and, and that'll solve it. But that's one of those things where you can do all sorts of cool and crazy and fantastic things in 3d space, but when it comes to actually physically assembling the thing, yeah, there's there's uh, there's complications that get associated with that. So, <clears throat> thinking ahead with with those kinds of things. Hey, Jay. Um, yes. 
we have a question in the chat. Ooh, goody. Uh, <laughs> what 3D printer do you have and what do you like or not like about that model? Ah, uh -huh. so I have a Ender 3 Pro uh, by Creality. And I, one of the things I really like about it is that it is, it is very doofus tolerant, uh, I'll say. It, it's, it's very, um, very resilient if you've never done a lot of 3D printing before. You can do, um, it, it will be very forgiving for doing any sort of mis uh, mistakes or, or those kinds of things. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to, to, to assemble and feed and, and get working. And the nice thing about the Pro is that it has this, this sort of Teflon coated uh, magnetic mat. So you don't have to worry about scraping things off the glass. You can just pull the mat off and, uh, and bend the mat and your, your, your print comes off of it. And it is one of my favorite things about that particular model is having that mat. Um, I've, I've worked with ones before where you, know, you have it on the you have to do the, uh, hairspray on glass and scrape. And it's, it, it, it's never clean and it never quite works the way that I want it to. And this, this mat really is one of the things that's really nice about it. As far as, um, things that I don't necessarily like about it. I think there, there, there's a lot of cap a lot of people who do mods to it, to give it uh, other capabilities. I've seen people uh, do laser cutting uh, additions and print other things to go and associate with that or, uh, but the build volume is not particularly large. I use it mostly for making these kinds of things. And for, you know, if something, something breaks, breaks, it's plastic or plastic enough, then I will recreate something to print it. Or if I'm working on, you know, I've, I've built little light fixtures and, and those sort of things with, uh, with it. And for that size, it works fantastically. Uh, I think the largest thing that I, that I made was actually a, a headphone stand. Uh, that's the shape of a hand that, that's holding it that way. Um, I should mention that I'm doing all of this uh, traveling full time in the back of a 37 foot uh, motor home. So that's, that's what I've been doing for the last year and a half. So I have my 3d printer with me because things do break, but yeah, that's, I would say that, that it does, it's not the fastest print speed. Um, and it doesn't have the tightest tolerances in terms of the default nozzle and, and those sort of things. But for, for getting started, uh, it's hard to recommend anything, uh, anything more than that. Uh, so that's, that's the Ender 3 Pro. That's my little ad for them. Yay. Cool. Uh, uh, there's actually a follow-up question. Someone sure. says, it looks like you're streaming from your motorhome. I'm guessing from the decor behind you. That's <laughs> true. That is, this is technically, I, I just to uh, digress here, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen because this is funny. Um, so technically, uh, I'm in a motorhome that they, they call it a toy hauler with a back half of it is, is actually a garage. We modified that to be the office and, and uh, bedroom. So that's, that's a Murphy bed there that flips down and flips up for doing work. And uh, so yes, that's exactly what's, what's happening is uh, I am in a uh, motor home in the Florida Keys currently, and for the next few weeks, at least. So yeah, that's, that's that part. Uh, let's go back to sharing my screen. And I have a feeling that for some reason, yeah, Jitsi has a tendency to, whoop, that's not right, has a tendency to uh, make Blender non-responsive after I, when I start sharing screens. So we'll do it that way. Yes, you can start Blender with a, uh, with an icon. I, after doing a few add-ons and whatnot, I've gotten in the habit of just starting it from the terminal. But let's see, where were we? We were here. Back to the assembly part of it. So yeah, the this particular element right here, this Lazy Susan, uh, thinking ahead would have been smart. But fortunately, this most complex shape we have here um, compensated for that. Now, this is this is where a lot of the thought and work and design sort of goes into this thing. And, and this is where if you're doing these things, you, you end up doing a number of things to try to revise and, and make edits to it. So what we have here is the base I've already covered. Now this, we were talking before about how do you print something like this and uh, deal with cleanup of structure of the parts and pieces. Uh, 
And this one is actually a fairly challenging one because there's not really a side that I can lay it on that won't require some sort of support. And so really it's about what's gonna be the least annoying to try to do cleanup with afterwards. This is a lot, and then what, how much material do you wanna clean up as well? This is a lot of dead space under here that has to be has to have support built for it. So that's, that's not ideal, that's not great. Um, and will take a fair amount of time to print a bunch of stuff that ultimately is gonna get thrown away. Um, I believe what I ended up doing is printing it this way. So if I do it like that and rotate my view, oh, it's set to turntable. All right. But I printed it, I would believe, with one this side down. And so that gave me the fastest print. I did still have support structures in here for covering that top of the curve. And there was some cleanup to, that had to get done uh, as well specifically in but that so that this channel remain clean and also from what i could tell had the least amount of waste when i was when i was printing it again thinking about the the manufacturing process the reason why i also didn't want to have a lot of cleanup on these parts is because this is one of the main moving parts aside from the rotation of the overall thing these slides are the main moving parts within this design and so what you end up with is you have this component that pairs with it Ooh, so we can see it. Um, and so just to give you a sense of it, this part right here will slide on those rails because you want to be able to work on rings of different sizes. And so you need to have a means of having tension to, to keep that ring in place. And actually, there, there's, there's still some more improvements that, that could be done to this design. So uh, I'm always welcome to suggestions and, and recommendations. You'll also notice that this, there is this channel here. This channel, because once this thing slides in, I don't have, I never, one of the improvements that I should have put in that I never did was it was a sort of a, like a set screw to keep things in place. Instead, what I did is I modeled this whole channel. And if I an edit mode here, which is not horrible, but I modeled this channel. And what I do with that is I will use a string or a rubber band and tie it to keep that tension on there to keep the ring in its place. Now the ring is going to be living here, but so now I have two axes of movement covered, right? I have the rotational axis and I have, um, I actually only need two because I'll have to go in the other, in the other axis because the ring is, uh, I'm not be carving, not going to carve on the inside of the ring, not with this device at least. So I have my rotational axis, but I need to have an, uh, an axis where it rotates this way so that I can actually move the ring around and carve on it in the round. So I have a support for it, but I need to be able to rotate it and do those things. And that's where these two little buggers come in. So if I go to the exploded view here, what I've done is I have, uh, these are basically um, rollerblade bearings that you can get for just about any kind of pair of rollerblades. And they set themselves nicely in there. And with a little super glue, they don't move. And then this weird straw looking thing is, let's assemble these here. What we have is comes together and Mary's like so. So this, they're held in place because there is a taper to it. They're held in place on the bearings. That whole assembly actually gets locked in place by the string that's held there. And then these two fun things will rotate, which it's hard to see them rotating because I didn't put any visual indicator that they're rotating. But these two things can rotate and that's where the ring gets mounted. And I can, with one more small non-printed device, um, I can actually keep the, the ring in place and prevent it from moving. And so, so there's a lot of different parts to this, right? There, there's, there's a bunch of different components. And because the, the build volume for the uh, my, my 3D printer can't do all of these parts all at once. Also, by the way, 
printing these two, similar challenge because one, this one has, you know, yet printing something that's really tall that has to stand up. There's, there's a couple challenges with that one in, if you, if you're, you know, if you print it tall, I have to worry about the supports one side or the other that I have to clean up after. Then I also worry, depending on your material that you're printing in, and I'm doing this with, with PLA, you know, you're printing in layers. If I print in layers this direction, that's also the easiest direction for things to break. So it would, because if I put tension too hard this way, because it's kind of tree ringed around, the, each of those layers becomes a potential breaking point. So maybe it would be stronger to print it lengthwise, but then the sacrifice is that then I don't have a smooth surface where I'm going to be mounting my ring, which especially back here could impact how easily it spins and rotates. And then likewise for this one, because one fits into the other as a, as a, as a nesting piece, this one, I mean, cleaning up down, down the pipe is pretty easy because it's just going to marry with that. But you still have to worry about that, that strength component. And I think ultimately what I ended up doing is I did actually end up printing this one standing up. And I believe I printed it with uh, this flat facing upward. Nope, I'm wrong. I have printed it with the flat facing downward because this is this is the surface that was most important and basically i was rolling the dice to make sure that my and if it, if i do the layers tight enough if i do small layers then while there are more from one mindset that there are more potential points of breakage uh because you're doing it at such a much a finer finer print depth um it, it becomes more sort of solid in terms of of the way that works and again thinking in terms of designing for manufacturing as well as designing for usage. Um, there, there are obvious trade-offs in what's going to work best and, and what's not. And so yes, we have a question from the oh, chat here. Um, what's the most ambitious thing you've 3D printed using a blender design? And did the print turn out well? Uh, I will say the, the easiest, the easy question to that is the, uh, the first print never turns out well, <laughs> at least for me. Uh, it's it's always, especially with, with some, this is probably one of the most intricate things that I've done because it does have it is it is tooling for tooling, right? It is a tool for making other things, and I'm using tools to make it, which is I, I kind of like the 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 overlap of that. But this this is probably um, the most functional and complex and complex because it's a functional device. Um, I have taken a number of like 3D sculpts that I've made and 3D printed them and, and made them to do things. And while those are intricate and detailed and uh, I would say fun, uh, they're, they're not necessarily complex in terms of usability, right? They're not, they're, they're, they're complex to look at and they may be complicated to figure out how they're, how you're going to, like I, I, I 3D printed a, like I said, a hand and the hand itself is a sculpt of a hand and looking at it, there's a lot of detail. There's a lot of cool things in it. And, but really if I put the hand like this, as long as it fits the build volume, it's not challenging necessarily to manufacture. Now that one did have a challenge because I was using it to hold it. Um, I'm, I'm talking with my hands and I'm in the tiny screen. So let me do this real quick. So I, I the, the, the actual hand would be like that and I would mount it to the wall and the while that is is the functional part of that is really how do i mount it to the wall without the hand falling off and thinking about static weights and how much weight you can actually carry and, and those sort of things uh those those are considerations but it's not moving it's, and it's not not necessarily a functional prototype of anything it's just something really cool to look at and so i would say that this this thing is probably it took me a while to actually one conceive of it and then sketch it and then model it and then remodel it a few times uh, each iterative, each time iteratively to to make it work a little bit better. Um, but since I've already switched over to here, I can show the thing in real space. I'm going to try and move some things off my desk to make it easier to redirect cameras and stuff. So first, here it is. And yes, I printed it in black because because that's the PLA that I had. But 
So there's my, my binding string, it goes in the seam. I'm gonna try and see if this, ooh. All right. Is that actually visible? Possibly. I can't see me seeing it. So yeah. <laughs> that's, so the idea is that this thing rotates and I can spin these elements here to, to do the carving. Now this whole element comes off and there's the bearing and yeah this one was printed like that nope yep yes it was sorry <laughs> i'm looking at it and making sure that i'm not telling us again because i need these channels to be clear because if i had to like do a lot of cleanup in these channels then then that doesn't slide as well on these parts right here this disassembles and yeah so if you look closely and it stays in focus you can actually see that the the layers are are this way, but it it held up. It's held up to use for a number of different uh, number of different rings that I've worked on. Now you'll notice that if I tried to put, for instance, my thumb ring on this rig, um, <laughs> it's a, it's not really holding it in place. This 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 may look like a flaw in my design, but. Here's here's the solution that I that I ultimately ended up doing. This tubing, this is great tubing, and I've actually what I'll do is I'll cut off a chunk of that, cut a slit down it, make it sized so that the ring itself will nestle onto it and be pretty taut, and then that squeezes between these two cones. And that keeps the the ring in place. It doesn't move. And then once it's fully assembled, and held in place, and I put my handy dandy little piece of string. I tried it originally with a rubber band, um, but rubber bands have a tendency to to, to lose their elasticity, and um, that that bouncing was not great. So, little handy two half hitches that I can slide tight and. Now this is held in place. This still rotates freely because it's on the bearing and this whole thing rotates. And you hear that rattling? That's partially because of my mistake of not getting it uh, screwed and levered in from the bottom. But that there is this whole thing. And yes, if I try to lift it, the weight is sitting on the bottom and in, inside of the casing here. So this is one whole piece. But if I try to lift this from here, that's thing. Now I will say one of the things that I did for usability and I'm not entirely sure I did it right was I made this purposely round so that I could set my hand here as I work and I could carve on this side with, with my, with my blades and, and do that. And I can rotate. And since I'm, if I, if I go this way, I still have this sort of support hand basically because I don't have rubber footing in anything on here. I can rotate the ring if I need to do my carving and it's, if I really wanted to try, this could also maybe work as a lathe. If I were like, a, um, I, I have a good feeling that that would just tear this whole thing apart because I don't think it's made for that kind of high speed spinning. Though um, maybe one day when I get tired of using it, uh, it will uh, be one of those things that I that I I do just to make it just self destruct in glorious fashion. But the other cool thing is that this this is in PLA. This is all in plastic. This and this functions and serves for me, but. There's nothing saying that this couldn't be at this point manufactured. And you know, if for instance, if these little axles here end up ended up not having the tensile strength that I need, this is a design that I could easily get done as a as a as a piece of metal and have that. Uh, fabricated that way and basically you know you could see and see it but probably easier just have it like drop forged or or something along those lines and so that let me put that there and pull me up here and hello again and so that's 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 designing for manufacturing that's designing for um for 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 use as a tool and I will say one of the really fun things is that, oh, I left my keyboard. Can't switch screens without it. Um, one of the really nice things that I can, that, that doing things in Blender and doing things 
with 3D printing in general, one of the things that facilitates you is the ability to share and have other people improve. And so, but of course, this is on Thingiverse. And the I'm reasonably sure I included the blend file and um, build instructions and you know how to print it out and at least the way that I put it together and those sort of things. You can see this is kind of, in this video, you kind of see where I, I realized, oh, I, I can't screw that part into that part. That's, mm. <laughs> um, but for, I would say, I would say for the cost of a 3D printer and free software and the computer to do the 3D modeling and the PLA to do it, I was able to put in the, the bearings and whatnot. I was able to do this. And while that is not free as in, uh, beer there's you know there's there's no there's absolutely financial costs associated with that it is substantially less expensive than the uh professional engravers mount that that they use it serves my purposes and um and i i would say also that it's 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 custom built to fit my particular workflow right there are there are things about the the those, those really nice fancy mounts and they do a lot of really great things, but they're also built primarily for jewelry makers uh, and engravers that, that work a particularly different way. They don't, they're not necessarily working in wood for their jewelry. So uh, that, that provides some additional constraints and challenges and fun parts to do with that. Um, yeah. So that's, that is sort of a, the, a brief sort of, I'll just say walkthrough of a single example done with basically entirely in Blender. I think I did a little bit of pencil and paper scribbling, but this entire design and concept was done in Blender. Uh, I think I used Cura for converting it to G code for printing. Uh, and that's, that's also open source. So that's by yeah. Ultimaker, but so. I just want to jump in here because there's a relevant question. Yes. Um, what's the process to 3d print? From Blender, is it just file to print, or is it more complex than that? It is. It is a slightly more complex than that. Um, so there, I think there may be a Blender add-on that goes directly to G code, but I've I've never. It doesn't. Blender itself is made for the creative process of that and trying to visualize your layers and visualize tool specific. Uh, requirements. It's not it's sort of not built within Blender and trying to build that as an add-on to Blender while very cool would also probably be a, a um, an enormous task because you have to account for all the different makes models uh, and, and whatnot that, that are coming in. Community can do that, but community has already done that on some level with tools like Cura. And so what I end up doing is I will export my you can there are 3d printing tools within blender to make sure that your geometry is sane basically you don't have any non-manifold uh meshes which means meshes that are like a single a single face that has no depth that the whole thing is watertight <clears throat> sort of the basic sort of solid modeling concepts you can do a quick sort of 3d printing pre-check from within blender there to make sure that that will actually work and then you export that basically as an STL file and you can do that. It'll, the exporter will, will adjust the orientation to, uh, cause a lot of 3d printers will use, won't necessarily use the vertical as a Z axis. So sometimes you have to rotate that, um, as well as adjusting for scale. I do model and blender at scale. I use my units set properly, but I've noticed that even, even in, uh, even though it accounts for it and makes it look pretty on import, uh, it will say, by the way, I scaled this by, you know, a thousand percent or 10,000 percent, even though the units should have been stored in the file. But in any case, the exporter still works. The importer on Cura still works. So you export to STL and then you pull it in, in, in my case, I pull it in Cura and lay it out on the bed in the way that sort of makes as most sense as, as, uh, I can make it and then preview it. And then if the print time is tolerable, and the amount of material used is tolerable. Uh, go ahead and do it. Usually, again, first, of, for first, second, thirteenth run, uh, I would do those at lower precision, faster, faster prints, just to make sure that the overall idea and concept actually works. And then, then I'll spend, you know, I'll do a sort of a high quality print because it, it does have a need to uh, stand up to me banging around on it and and those sort of things. So. 
brief brief answer is export to STL and you sorry use the the 3D printing tools to make sure it's watertight and uh, 3D printer safe. Export to STL, pull it into your um, G code creating tool of choice, and go from there. The uh, we do have a thought from the chat, which is Ooh, I like thoughts. Um, <laughs> You may want to break up your tough to print items and then use a PLA glue to put it back together. Then you could invert for printing and not need support structures. That, especially for the this top piece, is 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 a really solid suggestion, a really good idea. Um, I never, I don't have a whole lot of experience with PLA glue. Um, most of my experience is with uh, CA glue, super glue. And because a lot of the rings, they're at least especially like the shiny ones, that that's that's actually what I'm using to finish and and put shine at, uh, on it. Is that that's actually the finish is done with super glue, basically cyanoacrylate. And so most of my experiences with that, which tends to be brittle and doesn't necessarily have a lot of uh, structural strength when dealing with 3D print. So if PLA glue can do that, that'd be fantastic. The question is, for me, I'd have to figure out which parts are glueable and still maintaining structural integrity. So likely I would probably print out this on this on this complex piece. I would print maybe the base up and then the ring would be a separate print. The challenge of course with and this is something I've run into especially with the uh the Ender 3 Pro. I don't know if other ones have this issue, but if you if you're just printing like a thin wall if it's just a single thing standing up um Sometimes if it doesn't have enough support going around it, uh, it tends to, even with bracing supports, if you have something over top of it, that it, has, it can fall over pretty easily. And so I would have to make sure that my walls are thick enough that it, when I print it, it doesn't fall over. Um, but that's, yeah, that's a great recommendation. And um, I think if, I, if, I, if the top of this thing ever broke in the future, I, I, would, I would probably take that approach. Nice. All right, we have another question. Yes. Um, any advice for Blender newbies? Favorite channels or tutorials? Website? Yes, uh, I, I am. I will say I am. I am a little biased simply because of my association with CG Cookie, but I think that they have a really good starting point. Um, and and then for getting farther along at their their um, their citizen citizen uh, training subscription is, is actually pretty solid. The Blender. Uh, Blender Foundation and Blender Cloud, they've got a lot of really good getting started uh, videos. There's always the 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 donut tutorial by Blender Guru. Everyone sort of refers to that one. That's somewhat that one's still pretty relevant for getting your hands dirty and and first getting sorry, your hands dirty and your feet wet, mixing metaphors here, but getting getting started and getting rolling with Blender, those those tutorials tend to be a really good starting point. Um, I will throw in a, a pitch like I did happen to write a book. Uh, <laughs> uh, Blender for Dummies. It is not necessarily a tutorial based book it's more of a, of a beginner's reference so it's a good idea it's a handy book for understanding why things are doing the things they are or what sort of things you would do for an overall workflow or what does this button do and why does it do it kind of things that's that's really the 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 best use case for for blender dummies um, those would be sort of the best best sort of self-driven sides of things. I would say also that the Blender Artist forums, Blender Artists, Blender Artists plural dot org is is probably one of the largest English speaking Blender communities uh, on the web and has been around for ever. I, I happen to be a moderator there as well. And uh, in terms of getting help from other people who are working on stuff or uh, showing off your artwork or, or those sort of things, that's the place to go really to get a lot of good community support, uh, at least asynchronously. If you want it real time, uh, the Blender Foundation does host a Rocket Chat instance called Blender.chat, which is Blender.chat. You just point your browser there and you're off to the races. And there's there's a user channels, but it's also where the developers will will hang out and do real time collaboration stuff as well. Let's see, but I just want to make sure that was CG Cookie. Uh, Blender Cloud. Uh, yeah, so C Donut. Okay, go ahead. So yeah, CG Cookie, um, the Blender Cloud, which is run by the Blender Foundation, 
and I would say that the the Blender Guru donut tutorial, and literally if you search for that, you'll you'll find it. Those those tend to be the three sort of video based starting points that a lot of people will go through. Uh, of course, you just type Blender in in in, uh, in YouTube or any 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 video streaming thing, and chances are good you're gonna you know you can't you can't go on a video streaming service right now and uh, throw a stick and not hit something that that's related to Blender. It seems like. <laughs> Right. Okay. Here's the next question. Uh, my thinking process usually ends in a mind map, but I was looking for something better looking than any mind map tool that I know. Is it possible to do mind maps in Blender? That is a use case I have never used Blender for. Um, it really, so if, if your mind maps are because I use I use mind maps an awful lot, and I actually my the one that I've been going to and has things that I I don't like about it, but they, they work is a uh, VYM. It's called it's an acronym for View Your Mind, and it's 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 written in an old uh, cute tools kit, but it does a job for me. Trying to do that in Blender, um, your challenge is going to be on connecting threads, and you can I can imagine there's a few ways you can do that. I would probably like doing it manually you could have bits of geometry and or bits of text actually that's probably better just use bits of text that put out an idea i wouldn't necessarily write a paragraph but you would have a bit of text and parent it to another bit of text that is the core of the idea and you could sort of get yourself a tree structure based on uh parental hierarchy within within the 3d environment which could actually be pretty cool the, the the difficulty is when i do mind maps i have a tendency to i'll have like a bubble that encapsulates an idea and then within that i'll have images or a bunch of text or a few other things and trying to have that sort of encapsulated structure just based on the 3d geometry alone so even the 3d viewport or even in the the, the node compositor are because the node compositor also already gives you the ability to draw a lot like connecting points between two nodes. The The difficulty there is that there's not a lot of meta information that you can associate with that unless you start building an add-on for it, which is what I would do next is I would, okay, if I'm going to use this, this, this parental hierarchy mechanism, then I would be able to add little bits of, because every object can have custom data associated with it. So I might use an add-on to build an interface where I can click on say a cube and that cube represents whatever idea or a bit of text, probably smarter, a bit of text that says you know, idea. And then within that, I can encapsulate you know, maybe an image or, or those sort of things bundled with that. The other way to do that would be with a, again, develop an add-on for Blender that uses the node editor as your mind mapping tool. I've seen actually people do that for, uh, if you're doing uh, branch storyboarding, kind of like how, um, Oh, what's the Twine? Uh, Twine is a, is a really cool tool for, for doing uh, sort of branching stories, like for, for a game or choose your own adventure stuff. Um, that is a pretty cool interface and a pretty cool way of doing that. You could do that with Blender's node editor if you wrote custom nodes for it to, to pull that off. So long story short, you could use Blender for it, but you would probably end up developing a Blender into a tool to do it, uh, which could be pretty sweet. One of the cool things that are coming up with Blender, it's sort of a little bit of a digression. One of the things they announced at the last Blender conference was this concept of Blender apps, where Blender is, is a platform for creating tools. So again, this kind of goes back to the conversation of designing tools to designing tools that are you building, making things for making things, right? So in this case, Blender is a thing for making things, but then you're using Blender to make things to make other things. So in this case, you, the Blender app would be, maybe you strip away the parts of the interface that you don't need and only have the node editor with a specific, uh, specifically some specific Python uh, add-on code to make it into a mind map. It's all built within Blender as a Blender app, but really it's whatever your application is, Blender is just a platform that you're, that you're doing it. And that's one of the things that they're working to uh, to make with the next few of releases is really facilitating that kind of development. And um, I'm actually pretty stoked to to do that sort of thing because a lot of the work that I've been doing with, with Orange Turbine has actually been uh, more industrial and 
more with manufacturing folks. And so if you want to have a process that is being refined and you don't need to necessarily need to have a full 3D suite, you just need to be able to modify different parts of geometry within some constraints, then stripping away all the stuff you don't need that would confuse you know, somebody who, who's not used to using Blender is is a really, really fun way of approaching that. So there's there's a whole bunch of cool things that I'm excited to see what comes out of there. So, yeah. If you want to take a few minutes to just wrap up and, you know, add anything else you want to add, you can go ahead. And if a last minute question comes in, I'll jump back on. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm just going to do this thing. The easiest way to track me down, we'll go with that, is by way of my website. That's monsterjavaguns.com. Also, any social media related stuff, Monster Java Guns is me. That is an anagram for Jason Van Gumster because that tends to be easier to spell than my name. Um, but this is also, I have, I'm a little bit behind on, on updating my, my little website here, but it points to all the other different projects that I have myself involved with, uh, be they writing projects, 3D projects, orange turbine, uh, carving a lion into the top of a table with an angle grinder, <laughs> uh, little bits of code, or or the books uh, books that are write fiction and nonfiction. This is basically the home for all of that and how to get in touch with, get in touch with me. So yeah, that's, that's the basic wrap up of that. I, I would just say that from a design standpoint, the 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 biggest thing is is Blender can be used for all sorts of things. And, I, and again, the, the the Blender apps component of that I'm that that they're trying to roll out in future versions, I'm really stoked about that because in, then yeah, you're you're designing a tool that are that's very specific to a thing that you're doing. And so because Blender can do so many crazy things, you can apply that with a design mentality and all sorts of different. In interesting ways uh, because your blender obviously blender is 3d right it's going to give you the ability to think spatially uh, in, in a way that maybe your, your traditional vector drawing or, or 2d application doesn't natively have right uh, i think paul yesterday was showing some really cool stuff with grease pencil and you know being able to light your vector drawing or or those sort of things those that that's a whole dynamic that that um i think is ripe for exploration in terms of design and, and just creation in general. Um, but it also gives you the ability to think kinetically, right? Blender is not just a 3D modeling tool, it's an animation tool. And most of what we do, especially when it comes to things that are design related, they, in, they involve an interaction. They involve change over time, change in state, change in appearance, change in whatever. And so being able to have a tool that you can animate things in and control when those animations happen uh, is is very nice at the very least just for conceptualizing a design uh, but you can also execute those designs as well awesome thank you so much jason this was a great talk i like how it merged uh you know making things with uh you know software um, i'm a crafter myself so i really appreciated that and also recently uh, my household has adopted a 3D printer, so I was excited to, you know, see see you talking about that. So thanks a bunch for your time and joining us from the Florida Keys. When you mentioned you had to turn the AC off, I was like, where is he? Um, so now <laughs> the, the dots have connected for me. Um, and And thanks a lot again. Take care.